let's um, get underway in terms of the next session, which is to look at what's been a lot of change lately with regard to the tax environment and how deals uh, and deals are structured and considered in light of uh, the change. So John Beneke, um, who we've known for a long time and is very, very clever um, at True Partners Consulting, is going to lead this next session. So thanks, John. Take it away. William, thank you for the great introduction. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for attending. Um, secondly, I'd like to apologize because William just put a lot of pressure on keeping a bunch of tax folks in line with keeping the time down so you can get to lunch. So as anyone's dealt with tax people, you know that's not an easy thing for us to do. Um, but as William mentioned, I'm a tax partner with True Partners Consulting here in Chicago. I lead our federal tax practice and I've been working in federal tax for over 25 years over the course of my career, starting my career with Anderson, spent some time with Deloitte Post Anderson and, and was with True Partner since the beginning of time. So that's my very brief introduction. I'm a federal tax person by technical background, um, but I'll hand it over to the rest of the panelists to give them a little of your background. My name is Jeff Olin. I'm the VP of tax, Global Tax at CDK Global. We are a $2.3 billion software company based in Hoffman Estates. We were a spin-off of ADP. We spun three and a half years ago. We're actively buying and selling companies, mostly on the buy side. We have between eight and 10 opportunities in the pipeline at any given point in time. Uh, I am fascinated with tax, believe it or not. I like to think I'm not your usual tax guy, so I'm gonna keep this brief. Try not to use too many acronyms, uh, but I'm happy to be here. I'm Jeff Goldman. I'm a tax partner at Polsonelli, uh, and we are a 900 lawyer firm that uh, uh, spans the, the country. Um, I've been doing tax since 1990, starting in New York, uh, and our firm's focus is uh, corporate M&A and other things, and we have a special focus in healthcare, uh, in real estate, um, in IP. Uh, and we do a fair amount of stuff both domestically and cross-border. Okay, hi. I'm Dan Van Vliet. I'm a managing principal with the Griffin Group here in Chicago. Uh, we are a valuation consulting firm. Uh, we focus on valuations for tax, litigation, and transaction purposes. We provide expert testimony in the Delaware Chancery Court, U.S. Federal Court, Bankruptcy Court, and various state courts in arbitration. Um, this is a very interesting time to be a valuation expert right now because of the dramatic changes in the tax laws. So uh, I'll be interested in hearing what my panelist friends have to say, and, and uh, I hope you'll be uh, uh, interested in what uh, some of my perspective is on this as well. Well, great. Thanks, everyone, for those introductions. And in terms of the format, um, as you see, we have a cross-section of financial professionals who are involved in M&A transactions from a tax-specific perspective. We got the corporate perspective, the valuation, as well as the structuring perspective. So hopefully, amongst the four of us, we can address any questions that you have. Certainly, if you have questions throughout, um, we won't feel bad if you want to interrupt us, but we are gonna leave some time at the back to handle questions as well. So um, if you want to just kind of write a note to remember the question and feel free to save that. I, I think we'll all be sticking around afterwards as well to answer any questions you might have. But just to set the stage a little bit for you know, where we're at today, um, anyone who's picked up the newspaper realizes obviously this is a pretty important time um, with tax being the headline, but I think the headline's much deeper than you know, the, the one that gets all the headlines with the tax rate change. There's a lot more details in there. The interesting thing for me when William reached out with the opportunity to present on this topic here at this session, for me it was really personally interesting because last year I had actually done a presentation, a series of presentations across the country focused on M&A and you know I covered the tax aspects of it and it was pretty interesting because every single panel that came up here so far today has had one constant thread, right? There are multiples that are through the roof, so multiples are high. It, it's a little bit of that supply and demand, right? Lots of buyers, there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, whether it's in private equity or public companies with access to cash to do the deals. There's a limited number of what I'll call quality things to buy out there. Um, so it's driving the multiples through the roof. And last year, that was no different. We were in the exact same position. Multiples were on the rise 
access to cash was out there, whether it was private equity, private, or public companies. Deal flow, however, and this was kind of an anomaly given where we were at, and it was just a timing thing. Tax was really the party that was kind of slowing things down and really kind of creating a little bit of pause in the deal flow because of the uncertainty. There were a lot of questions about, okay, the rate's going to move. Where's it going to go? The number one question I got last year from all of my clients, whether they were public or privately held companies, private equity companies, was where's the tax rate going to be? It was the one time in my 25 plus year career I couldn't be wrong because no one knew. And my one answer was lower than 35%. We all knew that. Was it 15? Was it 20? Was it 25? Which created a little bit of, you know, kind of trouble when you're looking at transactions. Also, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, um, you know, it had the effect of slowing up a lot of those transactions. So, you know, from a deal perspective, I'm, I'm going to go to Jeff first because he does a lot of work on the front end with the, the structuring. My sense and my pulse was that the deal flow was actually getting slowed up by more of the tax considerations as opposed to what many times slows things up on the, you know, on the actual deal itself side. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely right. With, with one slight change, which was everybody was waiting to see what happened. And then once, actually, we got the word from our policy folks in Washington that rates were going to go down low and there were going to be some other things that I think Jeff will talk about, about immediate expensing of, of purchased assets. It became very, very valuable from a tax standpoint to close deals in 2017 uh, because uh, those, those deductions were just worth a lot more when the tax rate's 35% as opposed to 21. So wait, 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 and then let's see what we can finish before the end of the year. You know, you know, I'd be interested as to get your, your perspective on the valuation side because where uh, we work really closely with the valuation experts is, is kind of helping them ascertain what are, one, some of the assets to be valued in the context of maybe some, some deferred items that are parked on the balance sheet. What rates should you apply? I'd be curious as to your thoughts from a valuation perspective talking 2017, what it was like in 2017, and then later on in the discussion, we'll fast forward to current day. Right, well, in, in 2017, um, this tax law just didn't show up on January 1, 2018. It was really, goes back several months prior to that. Um, the House actually released its version of the Tax Act, uh, I believe it was on October the 2nd, and then they had already cleared the path to budget reconciliation, so a 51% majority vote was already possible. Um, the Senate actually sent the uh, adjusted bill off to conference, I believe it was around December 20th, and then it was signed into law on December the 22nd. So any valuations that we're looking at uh, towards the end of the year, particularly December 31st, is going to contemplate uh, the tax attributes and how that affects value. Uh, the other thing that's important, particularly in the M&A market, is that oftentimes we look at historical EBITDA multiples, valuation multiples, and apply those to the earnings of a company. Uh, so if you're looking at a 2016 M&A deal and you say, well, I've got an eight times EBITDA multiple, now I'm going to apply that to my 2018. 2018 earnings from my subject company, uh, there's a very good possibility that you're going to come up with a value that's not very reliable. Uh, we've got significant changes going on in the tax law related to valuation, certainly the lowering of the corporate tax rate, the bonus depreciation calculation, the apparent ability, although we don't have clear guidance from Treasury yet, but the apparent ability to write off uh, qualifying property in an acquisition in the first year of acquisition. Uh, and then, in addition to that, all the capital expenditures are going to be fully expensed over the course of the next five years. All these things, well, and in addition to that, we've got interest expense limitations on leverage deals. So there's a lot of components of the tax uh, laws that are really going to affect valuation, you know, beginning really late 2017 and for sure in 2018. And so from a valuation perspective, you need to be aware of that, uh, particularly now, and, and looking back and older deals, bringing that forward into evaluation today is probably going to be a mistake without some adjustments. Thank you for that. And, and Jeffrey, I'm, I'm 
curious as to your perspective from the corporate side, knowing that you know your company is very acquisitive and you're look, always looking at strategic acquisitions. But in my experience, and maybe in your experience as well, corporate development always paints a very rosy picture with forecast and all these things that work into the deal models that the valuation folks help put a number to. Last year was probably no different than this year. You were looking at um, several transactions, I'm sure, and but you probably had to balance that with a little bit of, am I looking way too much through a rose-colored lens because I really don't know what's going to happen. I'd be curious as to your thoughts on how you address that from a corporate standpoint. Just to comment on uh, a comment that was made in the first panel too, it's like you know we just kept things moving forward mm -hmm. and tax really wasn't that big deal. We, we took a bit of a different approach. Our board was asking me to come in in September, in November, in December, you know, what's gonna, what, what is going to happen? What are, what are the chances of the House bill, the Senate bill? And all of this came together quickly. And so our deal people, we really didn't slow deals down. They kept the pipeline going. Uh, we moved to closure on one um, late in the year, whether tax was going to impact it or not. Did they scramble back to change their model after December 22nd? Absolutely. I'm still working with them. In fact, I just gave them a, a whole primer on the tax law and the impact. And even though the public accounting firms are still figuring a lot of this out, this law is only 75 days old. And so I gave them the primer, and they said, oh, we better go work on the models. Right. And, and I'll make a comment in the future a little bit from now about it's not just the rate change. Right? We gave up a lot to get the 21% mm -hmm. rate, and I'll right. talk about that. But I don't think it slowed our deal pipeline down, and it certainly didn't stop us from doing one acquisition. The uh, Department of Justice is working on that with uh, Hart Scott Rodino, <laughs> but that's public information. Mm -hmm. so. It's, it's interesting because everyone got really focused on the movement of that 21% rate and, and talking to clients both last year and now that we at least have a little bit more skin on the bones with this, you know, the recent uh, legislation, um, but not all of it, right? We're still working to that point. But the one thing that I was cautioning folks is it was a lot deeper than, than that, right? That was the easy, that was the headline. But it was a U.S. tax law change with global impact beyond taxes. For any of the multinational folks in the room, you quickly realize that you're gonna to have to relook at your business entirely from a structure perspective, right down to things that happen outside of tax, um, although they touch on tax, things like transfer pricing, right? Are you gonna be in a position where now you're all of a sudden shifting from what used to be a lower tax jurisdiction to a higher tax jurisdiction. You, you gotta look at all of those items. So it was a US tax law change with global impact, and guess what, it didn't stop with that. It has financial statement impact, so all you had to do was for the last several weeks, pick up the Wall Street Journal and you would see another earnings charge um, in the form of taxes running through because someone's issued their financial statement and taken a you know, X billion dollar charge because, you know, if you think about it, companies also have a balance sheet side of the equation as it pertains to tax. And so there's a lot of things that had to happen. I personally lived through those over the last couple of months because since the law was enacted in December of 20, on tw the 22nd, we had to, um, you know, prepare the financial statements for public companies as if it was in place and, and kind of um, go through all of the tax impacts in the public disclosures and reportings in their 10K. So it, it's very broad sweeping and, and we're just in the very beginning of it. So in terms of those aspects, um, I'm curious, um, since you sit on that side of the fence, had you already kind of modeled that out or was it a little bit of a fire drill? Because And, and I'm asking the question because for maybe those in the room that are with public companies, you've kind of are, are maybe at the back end of that process for those with you with private organizations, probably a, a little bit of work to do in terms of getting there for some of the things your auditors will ask for. Yeah, I think you know three things in terms of, and this goes to due diligence as well. Um, the accounting that had to be done by year end, and we're a fiscal year, so we're still working through. We close six thirty, so we have a blended rate this year. Um, calendar year companies had to book something. The uh, SEC was kind enough to give us. Staff Accounting Bulletin 118, which is a due diligence mm -hmm. point now, because companies were able to provisionally book something. And now they have a year, or now 11 months, to fix it, to actually correct that. So due diligence point, we're looking harder at anybody mm -hmm. that has booked something under SAB 118. 
um, the EMP calculations for the one-time tax to convert to this partial um, participation exemption system, brand new international system, but we never got rid of the old system. So we had a one-time tax on earnings and profits. So a due diligence item would be, how did you calculate that one-time tax on earnings and profits? Mm -hmm. What are your foreign tax pools? And um, you know, when, when are you gonna pay that to the federal government? You get eight years to pay it. So that ought to be on the balance sheet. Now, those were just a couple items that would impact due diligence, things that we were thinking about at year end and now in, in what is to us Q3. That's a great point. And, and Jeffrey, to, you, to your side of the house, when it comes to structuring, you know, it, it's bigger than just the corporate side. I think we're overly focused on the corporate side, but there are some provisions on the pass-through entity side. In the context of deals and, and M&A activity, both in the public and private space, you know, entity consideration has to be even a, a big issue. That's jumped back up to the forefront when folks are looking at structuring a deal and, and what that form may look like. I'm sure. Uh, it used to be in the middle market, Mm -hmm. uh, unless you were doing cross-border work, uh, C corporations were not really in the mix. Uh, now, uh, there are really a couple of considerations that, that didn't come in as much, and one is, for, again, for the middle market and, and even the lower middle market, um, are you able to leave all the money that's being earned by your entity in the entity? And if you can, that favors a C corp because just talking about the rates, and you also get more deductions than you would than through a pass-through. Um, if, if the value of the company is growing and it's paying $79, uh, I mean, it's keeping $79 of every 100 that it earns, that grows a lot faster than in a pass-through where it is going to keep either $70 if it gets this new 20% deduction, uh, or 63 if it's just a flat, uh, uh, a pass-through tax. Uh, so if you can keep the money in the entity, then that's something to consider. Um, on the flip side, if you're a startup and you start out with a corporation and you decide that you don't like being a corporation, um, it's real easy to get in. It can be sort of painful to get out. That's helpful. Thank you. And Daniel, I'm curious as to, to your perspective on the valuation side. Um, since there's obviously new rules in place, in particular in the flow through area with a qualified business deduction. You know, from a valuation perspective, I'd be curious as to see how you're actually handling the modeling out of some of those nuances in the new law as it's passed. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of guidance, so you're kind of working with a little bit of a straw man in terms of kind of factoring it into your valuations, but I'd be curious as to your thoughts. Right, yeah, it, this is one of the more interesting areas of the new tax law uh, because now we essentially have three different types of business entities. We have C corporations and we have service-based pass-through entities and non-service-based pass-through entities. The non-service pass-through entities are essentially manufacturing, distributors, that type of thing. Uh, for those types of companies, the shareholders themselves get what's called a 20% QBI deduction, that's Qualified Business Income Deduction. And so they have maintained a lot of the benefit associated with being a pass-through entity as opposed to a C-Corp. For the service-based businesses like accounting firms, law firms, valuation firms, we didn't get that. So basically the QBI deduction, there's some limitations on it, but the QBI deduction doesn't, definitely doesn't apply to the income coming out of a service-based pass-through entity. So in essence, the valuation difference between a C-Corp now and a service-based pass-through entity has narrowed significantly. Whereas before we may have said that, well, this pass-through entity is worth more because it's only taxed once at the individual tax rate. C-Corps are taxed at the entity level and then again at the shareholder level using capital gains and dividend taxation. And there's an economic difference there between the proceeds that shareholders receive. Now that difference has been narrowed for the service-based businesses, and for the non-service businesses, it's still there, but guess what? It sunsets. So eight years from now, that 20% QBI deduction is going to disappear. So consequently, what's going to happen over the course of the next eight years is the value of the service-based, or the non-service-based businesses is going to start closing in and converging on C-Corp values. Uh, if we're talking, and I'm talking about an equity basis, fractional equity interests, if you're looking at a control basis, 
Uh, there's other things to take into consideration, something called a 338H10 election, where you can do a stock deal and treat it like an asset deal. That's a very interesting aspect of transaction structuring now because the acquisition of assets now may very possibly be deducted on your first year income statement. And so this qualifying property that you buy in an acquisition, you may be, may be able to dump that all as an expense on your first year income statement and basically drive down your pre-tax profitability. In addition to that, over the course of the next five years, your capital expenditures that you're making are fully deductible for the next five years on qualifying property. For the next five years thereafter, there's a step down. Uh, so you're gonna see a lot of depreciation on both acquisitions and just valuation in general being moved way forward. And you're gonna see improved cash flows, lower tax rates, which is gonna increase the value of both C corporations and past entities. The dark side of all this is, is that while this is all going on, the tax basis of your assets are declining at the same time. So you're essentially building up what's called a depreciation tax shield liability. And, or a, I'm sorry, a depreciation uh, tax recapture liability. So if you sell assets in the future, you may be hit with a fairly substantial capital gains tax. So it's not all free money. They call it bonus depreciation, but guess what, guys? You're not getting any more depreciation than what you're entitled to. What it's doing is just cramming all this depreciation forward, and it's going to affect the value of businesses. Uh, but you do need to take into account that there's going to be a decline in the tax basis of those assets, and there's going to be a ripple effect through your depreciation calculations on future cash flows. So those are just some of the more interesting areas that I've seen. Yeah, one thing from, the, from a deal perspective, and those are all valid points, um, on the corporate perspective and even on the, on the private equity perspective, right, where you have a buyer, um, I'll use Jeff as an example because he's sitting next to me, you know, they're looking to buy and hold, right, build up the company, um, not looking to necessarily buy and flip at some point in the future. I would think from a, from a corporate perspective, while you'll take into account some of those valuation considerations, since you're a more long-term buyer, they're probably less of a focus for you as a corporate buyer as opposed to the private equity space where maybe there's some value in saving some of that basis for an exit transaction. It definitely changes the model though. Mm -hmm. So my younger team ran downstairs you know, after my <laughs> session with them a week ago. Um, a couple of points, the 100% expense, I think there'll be more asset deals, 100% mm -hmm. expense. Mm -hmm. We're not capital intensive. We buy software API type companies that are more startup and we cobble them into our massive auto software system. We do all the websites for GM. So we're always looking for smaller, more startups. Not a lot of capital, but 100% mm -hmm. um, if we were to do a 338H10 or an asset deal, the goodwill is still over 15, but if they have more than two computers and a dog, we get to take the immediate <laughs> write-off in, in year one. Right. Um, against that is the 30% EBITDA interest expense limitation. So back in the days when we were borrowing at 4%, that might not have been too bad a deal. And now that we're triple D minus or whatever we are, you know, <laughs> our cost of capital is going up. And as we start to borrow to buy companies, we're going to start coming up to that 30% EBITDA limitation. That goes down to 30% EBIT in, I think, 2022. So I'm working with Treasury and our acquisition guys to say, let's you know, right. carefully consider the addition of, uh, of debt. And then um, all the international provisions uh, are, are you know, guilty. Uh, FDII, I promise not to use too many acronyms, but global low tax intangible income, foreign um, derived intangible income. We're looking at all of those, in, not only in our own value chain, but in our acquisition value chain. If we have international deals, you know, is that company going to get hit with guilty, even though it wasn't intended, just like we were hit with it, even though we didn't intend to move IP offshore? Uh, or could we generate on a positive note in an acquisition some more FDII, some more foreign-derived intangible income? So those are kind of the three big things that we're looking at in terms of acquisition strategy. Yeah, the interest if limitation. I just add one ahead. more component of this. I mean, there, there's, we're also facing a potential change in the cost of capital as well. Um, we've got lower tax rates, so it's possible the tax affected interest rate on debt capital is going to raise up. We've also got interest expense limitations now, uh, where it's possible that some component of your interest expense is no longer going to be deductible. We've had some of the hottest capital markets in my lifetime over the course of the last year and year and a half 
the impact that's going to have on equity and the capital structure of companies, we've really got a fundamental change going on in valuation that could really impact the overall cost of capital and may change you know, how you look at deals and, and how you price them. Yeah, getting the deal done has definitely, last year the problem was tax was slowing everything up with the uncertainty and, and when the legislation was going to happen, what the actual legislation was going to be. We had a framework that was put out, you know, third quarter of last year with not a whole lot of meat around it. So there was all this, you know, questioning. Um, you know, I don't know that interest limitations were on anybody's number one radar point when they looked at that potential legislation and then when everything got passed um, here we are with a new and improved interest limitation that affects how the deal gets done i'd be curious from a structuring perspective jeffrey in terms of the kind of some of the biggest hurdles you see in current deals now that we're sitting here with tax law that's in all of our laps not necessarily defined in all cases there's got to be some of the things that are on your kind of hit list of things you've got to be focused on in any transaction, whether it's a stock deal or an asset deal, public or private. I would think that you've got a few of those that are always on your mind. Oh, sure. Um, uh, in terms of the new tax bill, mm -hmm. some of it is the entity choice and the structure choice that I described before. And then second, um, it is certainly true that, that for, for buyers, they think that asset deals are much better because you can take all the... The, the cost of the assets off on your taxes immediately. And in theory, that would lead to increase the value of the company. On the other hand, <coughs> um, you have to advise folks and consider the fact that in, in four years, um, that, that depreciation that you've taken is going to significantly and possibly severely limit your ability to deduct interest payments you made to finance the deal and other things. And so it comes back to bite you that way. So. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a fun, complex uh, uh, exercise. The math is now critical, and the valuation and the corporate folks, it really has to be a, a team game now. Um, and, and, and I guess I would stop this uh, comment with, it, it's even more important than it used to be to consult tax lawyers, you know, like Chicago voting, early and often. <laughs> We like that, so <laughs> I feel free to reach out and call. I'm going to go to Jeff right on my right here because, um, you know, one thing, it's interesting that he, his corporation is a fiscal year, so they're in that phase of kind of getting ready for year end. I'd be curious as to your top three to five list of things that are on your list of focus on that maybe new this year that you didn't have to think about last year as you get ready for year end and the dance that you go through with your external auditors? So um, the, the things that come to mind are guilty, which is one that we did not move IP offshore, mm -hmm. yet that provision captures us. So mm -hmm. global, low tax, intangible uh, income, uh, taxable income. We do have 25% uh, uh, of our operation is outside the US. So we're caught in guilty. Mm -hmm. We have to make an estimate of what that's going to be. We're able to take a foreign tax credit against that uh, but it's a complicated, very much a formulaic calculation. Mm -hmm. So that's one on our list. Mm -hmm. We did not book anything. Right. Uh, wait, I take that back. We booked uh, three and a half million, but now okay. we can adjust it mm -hmm. uh, for that. Um, next up, uh, the, not for year end as much, but the 30% EBITDA limitation as we start to look at bigger deals. Mm -hmm. uh, that one is high on the list mm -hmm. here now that we're midway through the year. The smaller ones that are on our list, executive comp mm -hmm. is now subject to uh, a different limit. And so that may or may not mm -hmm. hit us. We're, we're still looking at that. Um, we've got um, several on the list, but uh, those are the, the kind of the ones. The Mills and Entertainment, believe it or not, I had a uh, public accounting firm out yesterday. Those are severely limited, and it could cost us a, a couple million bucks of no longer, this is deductible, this isn't 50% anymore, this is 100% non-deductible. Mm -hmm. um, those are some of the cats and dogs that are starting to come out uh, of our maybe year-end process. Yeah, you touch on the executive comp and the M&E. Those are two of the ones that kind of snuck in there a little bit below the radar. But when you read through them, they've got some real teeth for executive comp, for example. Some of the very significant components for those top executives in your company uh, think of the top five who may have compensatory components that were tied to different types of bonus structures. That is no longer allowed. So 
that could be a large impact depending on the size of your company and, and impactful to all. And guess what? It's permanent. So it's going to be a rate driver as well as M&E. A lot of folks have spent a lot of time, money, and effort analyzing their M&E expenditures to take advantage of and minimize the 50% disallowance. Well, guess what? Now some of that's going to be 100% disallowed. And all those studies you may have done years ago to come up with a statistical sample that you apply to your total population, um, you got to relook at that because those no longer apply. So there could be some traps for time as well as for significant permanent items that are rate drivers to your overall effective rate. So, you know, like I said, it was a little bit of the, you know, kind of, um, you know, what if scenario back in 2017. Now in 2018, it's like, now what, right? Because here we are, now what do we, we do with it? Um, I want to be respectful of time, and I know people are probably getting hungry, so I'm going to open it up to questions to the floor. So um, feel free to raise your hand, and someone will run over with a mic um, for a question. Uh, the federal tax, we already know, is a flat rate. Uh, I wonder what your projection of the state tax trend, and what's your ballpark to just think about if a company has sales in all 50 states, what tax rate are you estimating? Thank you. So COSO, which is an organization that's focused on state taxes across the US, the beauty and risk of uh, state taxes is that they're not consistent across the board, uh, nor will they all agree um, they'll rather agree to disagree as to what's going to happen. They all kind of agree that their base is going to go up. That's what most of the states are saying. How they adjust their own tax regime based on the impacts from a federal perspective, um, that'll start to play out. It's going to take them at least a year um, to even start to probably put out some guidance. You'll have some of the obvious ones, California, New York, and our good old state of Illinois will probably some, be some of the first that will come out with some guidance as to what they're going to do. But I think they all agree that their base is going to go up, um, which in turn raises the state taxes um, for all of us. Um, but really none of the details, I really haven't seen anything that's come out other than you know the, the guidance that's starting to dribble out from some of the, the state organizations. In the, uh, in the speed to get something done to close a lot of loopholes, obviously, other loopholes got created. Uh, is there a general consensus or buzz that uh, once, the, once uh, you smart guys have figured out how to uh, take advantage of those loopholes, they will then be closed, whether it be through pass-throughs, co-ops, what, what, whatever loopholes you guys can come up with? Yeah, they're, they're already working on a technical corrections that. act, if that <laughs> answers the questions, because they realize there's some gaps in the guidance. The good thing with this change and, and the, you know, the closest thing we could look to from this drastic of a tax overhaul was back in 1986, uh, where the good passive, active, passive activity loss rules kind of got rolled out. Um, so they're already working on some technical corrections. Um, international is always a place to plan. Uh, appropriately to, to minimize the overall effective rate and they know there's some gaps in some of the things that um, were put out there with beat and guilty where there's not a whole lot of substance around any of the guidance. Repat's probably the furthest along but that's a one-time thing that goes away so they will try to close those as quickly as they can. Um, there, there have, the IRS has <coughs> said that they can correct a couple of them via regs. Um, the three the, nowadays for um, for carried interest, you have a three-year hold, and they said this does not apply to corporations, and so every law firm in the country said, well, you need to convert your entity to an S corporation, because it's a corporation, and the IRS has now said that's, that's not happening. <laughs> a couple of others where, for instance, for what's called qualified property, they wanted to depreciate it, allowed depreciation over 15 years, and they referred to section X in the code, and they forgot to put that section in. That is going to be more difficult. I think, I think you referred to that earlier. Right, yes. And, and the issue about technical corrections, a true technical corrections bill, is you need both sides of the aisle to pass it. And it won't be passed under reconciliation. I don't know if that's... So, so it's going to be <laughs> Not tweaked possible. by regulation. <laughs> right. My view. One interesting thing that's rumbled out there, I thought it was really creative when I read it, and it came out pretty quickly after the, the new law was enacted. Some of the states, because they were very opposed to minimizing the deductibility of state income taxes, have come out 
and started, um, you know, kind of considering forming these essentially non-for-profit organizations that taxpayers can pay their money to claim a charitable deduction for because it's a qualified non-for-profit organization to satisfy their income tax liability. I don't think that's going to last very long, <laughs> just me, but um, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting and literally within like a week or two of the lobby enacted, I started seeing some of that type of activity. Yeah, you're, you're talking about uh, whether it's being measured on EBITDA or EBIT, I, I'm assuming. Yeah. And uh, it's basically 30% of those, one of those two components. Um, there's probably a likelihood that you may see a difference in capital structures, a difference in the use of debt. Uh, one of the reasons is that we're now using a lower federal tax rate to tax affect the debt rate. So that's going to actually elevate the uh, cost of debt capital in, in sort of an odd way, but that, that's what happens. Um, so that should impact just the overall capital structure of companies in general. Uh, the disallowed interest expense in any given year under the guidelines right now can be carried forward. So it's like an NOL in a way. So you can like use it to offset future taxable income uh, as long as you're falling within the guidelines. Highly levered companies that are low profit, they're going to be running into this issue, and it's going to raise their cost of capital. It may affect their cash flows, and it has to be taken into account in valuation. Um, and that's going to have to be separately modeled depending on what situation is. It's really interesting in the bankruptcy court where, you know, by definition, these companies are highly levered and uh, have problems with profitability. Uh, the determination of workout plans, for instance, how that's going to be impacted by all of this as well. It's, uh, it's a little, you know, it's... We don't have perfect ways of dealing with all this, but I think in general what you'll see is a lower use of debt and capital structures. You'll see some differences in uh, interest expense and the interest expense limitation that will affect uh, the overall cash flows of the business. But and once again, remember those interest expenses that are disallowed in any year, are you're able to carry those forward and offset uh, future taxable income. So the tax law was 26 days old and some of the firms were coming out and saying, you know, if you borrow outside the U.S., you won't be subject to the 30% of the limit. So <laughs> there are some thoughts out there now that you just borrow and then could you borrow and lend, create interest income back in the U.S. that would help your limit? I mean, there's some different, because it's your net interest expense. So there are some ideas being generated out there to try to address it. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the interest limitation is this is, a, this was a rule that was out there under 163, um, but they just gave it more teeth, right? So it, it applies to more people. It's been expanded and, and all those things. And, and as Jeff mentioned, quickly people figured out a way, well, if I just did this, then I could still benefit from it. But it is going to impact it because it's something else you have to think about when you're structuring a deal and trying to finance a deal and, and looking at another variable in the equation. It yeah, hasn't I, taken all of the fun out of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Sorry. think to some degree the um, Congress was concerned about people levering up and buying capital equipment and then expensing that. I think they were trying to put a little discipline in there as well, mm -hmm. which was part of the, the motivation of putting some more teeth into those mm -hmm. issues. Any other questions? Are people really hungry? <laughs> If there's no more questions, I think that that's all we have as a, as a panel, and I'll turn it back over to uh, William to kind of take us to the next phase.